uh, Hans Buvalda. Uh, I'm even going to take a shot at it today. Dale Emery, Bob Galen, Julie Gardner, uh, Dorothy Graham, Jeff Payne, and Martin Paul are all kind of sitting over here in the peanut gallery uh, waiting to begin. So uh, let me get my, uh, we don't have a gong, but we do have a, a, a timing device here. So let me introduce uh, Michael Bolton, and uh, let's welcome Michael. Thank you, Lee. Where is your timing device? Do I get to see the timing device? Oh, like that. Got it. Thank you very much. Hello. I'm going to make things easy for you. I'm going to make it easy for you to do a memorable talk. That's what I'm going to do. Um, I would like to talk for the next five minutes or so about uh, something that I kind of discovered a few years ago buried in the session-based test management stuff. And then after a little while, after a little bit of thinking about it, I realized its significance. Stuff like that happens. It takes some time to learn about the significance of stuff. What I learned about, I noticed that in the session-based test management reports, there was a section on bugs. Oh, well, that was easy to understand. We know what a bug is, right? A bug, informal definition, is something that bugs somebody. Who matters? Or a little more formally, a bug is anything that threatens the value of the product. But then there was this other section in the session-based test management uh, uh, reports said issues, uh, issue. Well, you know, if we got to have a definition for bug, we should have a definition for issue. And then I realized how, hmm, an issue is anything that threatens the value of our testing or anything that threatens the value of the project or anything that threatens the value of the business. Now, for testers, most of the time, an issue is going to be related to the stuff that we do. It's going to be anything that slows down testing or makes it harder or uh, uh, confuses us in some way or represents a lack of information or represents a piece of equipment we need, a, a tool that we could use, a, a skill that is in some way absent from the, the team, something that threatens the value of our work. So anything that threatens the value of our testing, boy, that seemed pretty good. That seemed like a really good idea. This is a nice little thing you can add on to the bug report. But then my thinking about this evolved some, and I realized that issues were potentially even more important than bugs. Because if an issue is something that makes testing harder or slower, then an issue is something that gives bugs more time and more places to hide. When we test, we are under a good deal of pressure in order to produce useful information quickly for the project. So anything that threatens the value of our work is something that we should pay attention to and that we should include in each and every test report that we provide. Because to test is to tell a story. It's to tell a story about the product, how it works, how it fails, how it might fail in ways that matter to our clients. It is also to tell a story about the testing that we do. That is how we got to the product story, what we did in order to determine what the product story is, how we configured, operated, observed, evaluated the product, and how we modeled the product, designed our tests, and so on. That's a second-order testing story. There's also a third-order testing story, which is Things that got in our way, slowed us down, made it more difficult for us to test, and gave more bugs more time to hide. That is very important project information. That's information that we need to deliver to our sponsors. Because although that third order testing story, the third order testing story is the story about the quality of the work that we've done, which gives warrant to the quality of the, te to the story, the testing story, which gives warrant to the product story. That stuff is foundational, and it represents potential threats to the value of the product, to the on-time delivery of software that we understand. So, 
instead of just thinking about how testers report bugs, let's think about reporting issues. Requirements missing? That's an issue. Because if the requirements are missing for us, they're probably missing for the programmers too. Environments don't match up with the production environment. Their test environments don't match up with the production environment. That represents a threat to the value of the product because it's going to allow bugs more places and more time to hide. So think about the quality of the testing story. Think about the testing story itself. And think about problems with the product. And you've got a complete story of your testing. Thanks. All right, thanks, Michael. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Hans Buvalda. Hi, everybody. I'm Hans Buvalda. For the next uh, half hour or so, I will talk about uh, a very important topic. I thought some topics are just more important than other topics, so why don't I just take my time? I'm sure everybody else will volunteer to take only one minute. Um, Mike, the question I want to pose here, the rhetorical question, is uh, automation, test automation, the same as programming your test. So now I have a bunch of tests, and now I'm going to program those tests. And my answer, no, it isn't. Okay, that finishes my time as my keynote. <laughs> that's, that's just about everything I wanted to tell you. Uh, I don't know if you remember Bill Clinton uh, became president with the slogan, it's the economy, stupid. So I would like to say... Uh, even more important, it's the test stupid. Uh, why are we doing this? Why are we doing anything with automation or not automation? It's not about making uh, some smart scripts. It's about making uh, intelligent, hopefully, effective tests. Uh, what you want to avoid is engineers, and then I mean engineer the engineer role, not necessarily the people, dominating your process that it is all about the scripts and I cannot get the scripts to run and uh, what about the scripts and what about the bugs in the scripts. Um, the, the logic, what are you doing in which order, it should be in the test. Now to emphasize that I have my own 5% rules, I feel that uh, no more than 5% of the team should be busy with the automation. Uh, so the other 95% should be testers. If you have a team of 20 testers, there should be maybe one automation engineer. That, I think that should be enough. And with that one automation engineer, no more than 5% of your test cases, I'm not talking about exploratory testing here, but prepare test cases, should be manual. So that one person should be able to uh, automate more than 95%. That, I think, is a healthy situation. Anything else than that, uh, we need to talk. Um, one more thing. Why uh, testing... It needs to be playful. That's why it's testing. Testers are supposed to find things that other people didn't think about. So testers need to jump out of the box. Testers need to be uh, more intelligent and more creative than, for example, developers. Are there any developers here in this morning? <laughs> Otherwise, I will shut up. So what you want to avoid, and that's what happens with automation, is that it becomes like a very stringent uh, mechanical engineering effort because it kind of dies down the, the creativity that uh, testers uh, should have. Now, here are some guidelines. Those guidelines are pretty real, as in uh, we use that in our own project. Uh, I enforce these uh, fiercely, if I can. Um, so don't let me notice you any uh, deviation from any of this. First of all, you need to keep your tests independent from each other. Uh, tests are like if, if your system is a planet, Tests are the satellites around the planet. I don't really like very big testing systems, uh, that you have uh, a very big system under test. That's your own problem. But uh, the test should be nice, clean, uh, and effective. What you also need to avoid, and it, it sounds like uh, that I'm kicking in open doors, and probably am, but it, uh, you, you will be surprised how often this happens. Uh, don't start programming. Don't start being the smart programmer. All kinds of table-driven, all kinds of uh, super intelligent things. I saw scripts where people were looping through the buttons and then uh, button number three, that is the OK button. It, it becomes too complicated. Uh, no variables, please. Uh, only the things that are really going to change between uh, one run or another, like uh, 
the, 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 the rate of the euro, to, uh, to take a very bad example. <laughs> uh, I am from Europe, by the way. But uh, be a, uh, I'm not from Greece, I'm happy to say. <laughs> <laughs> now, even more important, oh yeah, hard code you must develop as well, because I want to understand what you're testing. And if you give me some kind of a complicated script full of variables, I have no idea what values you're using. And I'm way too lazy. If I wasn't lazy, I wouldn't be in test automation. I'm way too lazy to find out what you have put in those variables. I really don't care. And the other big deal is no debugging, please. I often get uh, emails or phone calls or things like uh, uh, the test isn't working and we're debugging the test. Uh, if, you, if you know my work a little bit, you will know that is completely wrong. You're running the wrong test. The test shouldn't be run at the time. Or you should test your keywords first before you uh, use them in a test or anything like that. What you do need to be careful about is the big elephant in the room that is your uh, maintenance. Um, sensitivity to changes, uh, in other words, too much programming, can crush your automation. It can really kill you. Um, so you need to have action-based, that's my terminology for keyword-based, uh, uh, automation that you nicely organize in modules, each module having a nice scope, uh, etc. And then you should uh, be able to avoid the elephant. Okay, that was it for me. Thanks. Okay. It, was not, it was not half an hour. Yeah. Thanks, Hans. Oh, hmm, I know this guy. I want to tell you a story. Uh, if you were with me in my tutorial, you know that I'm a storyteller. It's called The Newlyweds and the Roast. It's a, it's a semi-true story. Um, my wife and I were first married. We were both young, poor, struggling college students. And I remember the day that we finally had saved and scrimped enough money to actually buy a roast. Uh, up until then, it was kind of hamburger and tuna fish. And it was such an important uh, day in our lives together that we actually went down to the grocery store together uh, to pick out the roast. And we brought it home, and I, of course, only know hamburger and tuna fish, so my wife started to prepare the roast. And as she unwrapped it, the first thing she did was took a knife and, and cut off a slice off one end and a slice off the other end and then took the roast and put it in the roasting pan and then put these slices kind of one on either side. And I'm observing this. I'm going, that's very curious. What is all that about? And so I asked her, I said, uh, honey, what's, what's the deal with slicing off the ends? Is that a, like a flavor thing or is it a cooking thing or what is that? And she thought for a minute. She said, I don't, I don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? Well, that's the way my mom always does it. Hmm, interesting. So I said, well, let's, let, can we call her and find out? So we called, called her mom and and you know, regaled her with the story and, and asked about the, uh, the ends. And she said, you know, I, I don't know. I've never thought about it. That's the way my mom always did it. So I said, well, let's, let's call Grandma and find out what's going on. So we did. We said, what's the deal with cutting off the ends of the roast? And she said, oh, well, when I was first married, we had a little teeny tiny roasting pan. And even the smallest roast wouldn't fit. And so I had to cut off the ends. And, of course, I wasn't going to throw the meat away. I, I put it on the sides. And I said, oh, isn't that interesting? Now, that got me thinking about processes. I mean, this is the roast cooking process. Most processes, when they're originally thought of, when they're originally defined, consist of two parts. There's the if part and the then part. If this situation, then do this. Like, if the roasting pan is too small, then cut off the ends. But what happens over time? Watch carefully. This is the PowerPoint animation part of the show. Right there. <laughs> Thank you. The if part gets forgotten, right? And we're just left with the then part. And so we repeat the then part over and over and over again, forgetting the original context, forgetting why we're actually doing this thing. I suggest that we find these same kinds of things in our business. We forget process context. And so we're left with rules that really don't make any sense, at least now. For example, 
If it is very difficult to gather, understand, and modify requirements, then we must establish formal requirements contracts with our stakeholders. And I think there was a time when this was the case. But, you know, I think the if part has vanished. But we still continue with a then. We still find ourselves feeling that we have to write these 500-page requirements documents. And we have to establish a contract. And it's a contract that can't be broken by either side. It could be modified, but we're very wary of that. How about another example? If once software is written, it's very difficult to change, and I believe that was the case years ago, then we must establish detailed documentation describing its inner workings in their splendid and gory detail. But I think that part's gone now, and yet we still find ourselves doing this. How about one more? If a substantial number of our testers are inexperienced, then we must document every test case in excruciating detail. And for many of you, that was the, the situation in your organization at one time, but it may not be now. And so we're still left with this idea that we must document every test case in excruciating detail. Um, when I lived in Colorado some years ago, the state legislature passed what was called the sunshine, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the sunset law. And the sunset law, the sunset clause basically says that every law, every committee that the legislature creates, every program has an expiration date. And that committee will go out of business on this date. That program will go out of business on this date. Whatever they decide will go out of business unless they formally renew it. And what I'd like to suggest is perhaps a way to deal with these process context problems is that we should add a, a, uh, you know, an expiration date to all of our development and testing processes. We're going to do this for the next so many years, but when that time comes, it's either, we're either going to stop doing that or we're going to review it and decide, yes, that was a good idea, or we're going to decide, well, it was a good idea, but its time has gone, or we might modify it. I think that would be a significant uh, help in all that we do. Thanks. Now I'd like to introduce Dale Emery. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, imagine an expert witness testifying for the prosecution. And this expert witness in the course of eight hours of testimony introduces facts into evidence, renders opinions about the facts of the case, and draws conclusions about the facts of the case. And the prosecution invites the judge and jury to take these conclusions into consideration when they make their deliberations. Unfortunately, in all these eight hours of testimony, the expert witness has made an error, a single error. He doesn't know he made the error. He, he renders a conclusion that is wrong, and he doesn't know it. He doesn't know it, but he's adamant about it anyway. He's sure that this is true. Uh, fortunately, and it's a significant error. It's an error that if the jury were to accept this conclusion, that might tip their verdict from not guilty to guilty. This is an important conclusion, and he was wrong. Fortunately, the defender has an attorney, and the attorney quickly demolishes the invalid conclusion and, uh, and helps the jury to understand that this conclusion could not possibly be true. The next week, uh, a couple of months later, the same prosecutor invites the same expert witness to testify. Eight hours of almost flawless testimony. One egregious error that could make the difference in the trial. The defense attorney demolishes this one error. So what happens in these cases in the jury's minds? Does the jury say, well, eight hours were pretty good and all of it was, it's one thing they got wrong. So I'm just going to dismiss that, but the other eight hours, I'm going to accept, accept that as if it's absolutely true. Maybe. Unlikely. More likely, this single error raises doubts in the jury's mind. Raises doubts about various other parts of the testimony. Maybe about the entire testimony. Maybe about the prosecution's entire case. How many more times can this happen before the prosecutor stops calling this expert witness? 
set that aside, and imagine a different expert witness, your suite of automated acceptance tests. Your suite has, let's say, 800 tests in it, and it's connected up to a continuous integration server, so every time a developer checks in some new code, the, the, the continuous integration server calls your test suite into the witness stand and invites it to testify. And the test suite says, of the 800 tests, the system passes 900, 799 of them. One test says, this responsibility the system does not satisfy. On further investigation, you discover that the system did indeed satisfy that responsibility during that test run. The test lied. The next time a developer checks in, the same thing happens. The, the, the call the test suite to the jury, to the witness box. It testifies 799 tests pass. One fails, a different one this time. You discover after uh, investigating that this test too lied. The system satisfied this responsibility. Now, what do people do with this information? What do people do with this information? One of the things that happens is, the build failed. Somebody says, we'd better fix that. They stop whatever they were doing, which presumably was important stuff for them to be doing, and said, let's fix the build. They go and investigate, and they find out in the end that it was the test that was broken, not the system. They feel as if their time has been wasted. And if this happens too many times, and by too many times I mean two or three times, they stop trusting the entire test suite. They stop responding to the alarms it's sending out. They stop, at some point, they stop running the test or at least even attending to the results. So if you have tests that are unreliable in your automated test suite, when you discover a test that's unreliable, if it lies to you sometimes or all the time, three, three things to do. Step one, remove that test from the test suite immediately, immediately. Step two, if you can, and if you still want that test in your suite, fix the test. Sometimes this is difficult. Sometimes it's impossible. Step three, if you can reasonably conclude that this test no longer lies, reintroduce it into your test suite, but only if you have really, really, really good reason. And the reason I say this is that when people stop trusting your tests, it doesn't matter what the coverage is. The reliability of your tests is more important than the few tests that you would like to add but that are sometimes reliable. If people stop trusting your test, the value of the test suite plummets. So in conclusion, trust trumps coverage. I rest my case. Thanks, Dale. Appreciate that. Great, uh, great messages. Now we're going to hear from uh, Bob Galen. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So a, a, a day or so ago, Rob Sabrin invited me into class. He was doing a, a multi-day class on agile testing, and uh, he invited me in. I don't know what his sanity, is. I think, escaped him for a few moments, and he invited me in to do like a five-minute or a 10-minute lightning talk to the team, and he proposed two questions to me. Uh, he said, well, what is, it, what is the advantage for, to testers, or what is the great thing for testers uh, working in scrum teams? So what is the single greatest advantage or single greatest sort of opportunity? And then he flipped it around, and he said, what is the single greatest challenge for testers uh, working in scrum teams? And, uh, he, and, and he had sent it to me an email uh, a little bit before that, but I really I was busy, and I hadn't had time to, to think about it. And so I was sort of winging it in the class. But I've been thinking about it ever since. And uh, so for, from my point of view, it, that I think the, the biggest opportunity is to move to what I think I was moving to the front of the line of getting an opportunity to actually influence quality, to getting an opportunity to influence, to work with the business, to work with the product owner, uh, to do things that the testers haven't done before, to get visibility uh, with the transparency of Agile, uh, there, there's this opportunity to make, to make a difference, to, to be pulled into things, to be recognized for things that, that you may have not been recognized before on. 
this overall value proposition, this representation of the customer to become the, the voice of the customer, if that makes sense to everyone. Um, there's things around that that facilitate that. There's agile practices, I think, that leverage that opportunity like pairing. Uh, there's the notion of acceptance test driven development. Uh, so getting involved in acceptance tests, pairing and partnering with the product owner, with the customer are part of that. Uh, driving and enabling, a big part of it is driving you know, this, this opportunity to enable conversation and to, to drive, drive is the wrong word, but maybe empower conversation, uh, inspire conversation in the team at all levels, particularly focusing on the customer. Um, and then to have fun. One of the things I think of is, is in, the, in the impact that you're having, having fun with that, sort of embrace it and sort of celebrate that. So what was the, the challenge? The challenge sort of related to that, and I, I was thinking of a, of a tester at uh, in my current my current company. Uh, I'm going to call her Sally. I'm protecting <laughs> I'm protecting her name. Uh, but Sally, Sally, we hired Sally on a contract basis. She had been out of the workplace for about five or six years. She had worked at Oracle historically. She took time off to have a, a couple ch a child or two. Uh, she was out of the workplace, and and uh, she wanted to get back into testing. But we, we took her on in a contract basis because it really wasn't clear to us that she could, you know, the learning curve was sort of from her point of view as well. It's like, do I still have the chops uh, to really be, you know, a tester? So she came in with a five or six year gap, uh, you know, having kids, and she, she hit the ground running in our team. And I think this is the challenge of showing and demonstrating value, of making a difference, of having the courage to make a difference is sort of the counterpoint. Uh, to to this opportunity, you have to leverage it. And Sally came in, and I remember she one of the first things she did is she established a partnership with her product owner, and she had a tough product owner, and uh, in fact, our toughest product owner, very business centric, very very tough on his team, uh, probably tougher than he should be, uh, and and he kept the bar very high. And she made him uh, her partner, and she saved the team. Uh, by finding you know critical bugs before customer deployments when no one else was doing that she by the sheer force of her testing prowess and will and perseverance she earned his respect uh, I kidded with him on times I'll, I'll take her away and he literally wanted to explode he literally escalated to my boss said you, you can't take Sally away she started making a difference by focusing on quality focusing on influence she took a whole team view of establishing that holistic team view of QA or test plus development. Uh, she earned the respect of her development team. Uh, she, it turned from her pushing the team towards quality to everyone on the team, and I think this is sort of the measure for this, of getting it, and this is the challenge, where the team started pulling on her, where she flipped the bit on the, on the team, and everyone out of just, just respected her and her value, her value proposition to the product, to the customer and the team, and, and they would pull on her. And she never, and then she had to, she stopped having to sell her value proposition. She didn't have to, she had already, she had done it, and she had arrived. I used to a kid with the team that we would, uh, I, that I would take her, I, I'm a kidder, and I was like, I'll take Sally away. Uh, and I would get people outside my office almost with torches. I felt like, you know, Frankenstein, you know, Dr. Frankenstein and people wanting to torch me. But I think that's the key to have the courage to do that, to have that pool model. You know you've arrived when people are pulling you and engaging with you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate that. Um, now, uh, Julie Gardner. Good afternoon, and also good afternoon to the virtual conference people. I hope you're enjoying it. Um, my name is Julie Gardner, and I want to share with you um, the myth of 100% efficiency. This may sound obvious to us as testers and within our scrum teams and everything else, but to our managers, this has still been a question that they are curious about. I've had a number of emails from different managers saying, can you come in or can you give me advice because I want my test team to be 100% efficient or my scrum team to be more efficient at what they're doing. And conversely, a couple of weeks ago, I had a conversation with a lady called Beverly, um, and she was on the other side of that. She was, her team was constantly being pushed in the scrum team to do more and more over time. Her team were being burnt out. And for me, the answer is the same. This is not achievable, and I'd like to explain why. 
Imagine you've got a slider puzzle. I didn't grow up with angry birds. I grew up with things like this. Slider puzzles. Uh, and the idea is you're supposed to put the numbers from 1 to 15 in order. But in order to actually complete the game, and here's the one completed, you have to be able to move the tiles around. That's the objective of the game. That's the objective of the puzzle. So in order to do that, we need the space free. And let me find it. We need the space free. But unfortunately, if a slider puzzle was like our projects, our teams, our organizations, Unfortunately, management sees something different. They actually see that black square, that opportunity, that spare tile, to be a 16, that they could do more. So if we fill that extra space, we can become 100% efficient. Life would be good. They would get more for their time and their money. Unfortunately, that's not the case. We can't actually move around as a result of that. And even and more worryingly, we could actually lose the best asset in our organization, our people. So I would like to suggest to try and dispel this, use this sort of analogy to try and get the point across that you need slack in your projects. Um, because we can't sprint all the time for the agilists in the room, we need time out. For the, the traditionalists, it's the same thing. We need to be able to improve things. Ask the question, why do we chop off the legs off the roast? Um, and if we don't have that, then we may still be doing exactly the same thing over and over again. Um, we need to have time for innovation. Atlassian have just recently done an innovation sprint. I've heard of people just spending a sprint dedicated to automation. I think that's healthy because it's actually given us time out to think about what we're doing. It improves morale. Um, Ray Arrell stood on this stage two years ago doing a keynote about implementing Agile, what went right, what went wrong. Every single member of that Scrum team enjoyed the way that they, well, implementing Scrum, but the majority of them, over 70% of them, considered themselves burnt out. That's worrying for me. I would suggest, and I mentioned to Ray that I think that they need even more slack in their projects. Time to actually improve in those retrospectives. Retention of staff, keeping your best people motivated and happy in what they're doing. So if someone's trying to give you the push about 100% efficiency, maybe you want to suggest this is the kind of things we need to consider before we start to put some sort of metric in place to deal with it. <laughs> um, we need to make sure that there are no meetings. Now, there was a study in the UK a couple of years ago that said uh, on average 52% of meetings were considered worthless. I think that's low. I think that's a lot higher in the real world. So we'd have no meetings. We'd have no interruptions. In their book, People Wear, by Tom DeMarco and Tim Lister, um, they basically say any interruption can actually mean that we lose 20 minutes trying to get back into the original train of thought that we had before that interruption. How many emails do we have on a, regular, on a daily basis? How many phone calls? How many tweets? You know, all these constant interruptions, they're a reality. So if we're going to try and meet this 100% efficiency, we need no interruptions. So would we actually even achieve anything? Because we need to collaborate and communicate in the first place. No comfort breaks. I'm not even thinking about that one. Uh, every tool, skill level available when needed. We have crystal balls. We can predict what's going to happen in our projects. Um, and there's no need to improve because we're all doing best practice. So if that was possible, then maybe we should even think about it. But in the real world, 100% efficiency is not possible. We need that slack. My final thoughts for you. Your managers, your business have actually spent time and money for you to come to this conference. I'd like to think that you've got lots of ideas and suggestions and ways to actually improve your testing, um, how you're doing things in your organizations and your projects. The conference has actually equipped you with the tools that you need to do uh, to uh, put those things into place, your ideas. Um, but you need time. With that time, you need slack in your projects and your overall schedules. And I do know it's schedule, not schedule. I am from the UK. Um, but you need time in your schedules in order to make that happen. Um, I have a few of the slider puzzles. If your management don't grasp this concept and you want one of these, I have about 50 or so to give away. If you just want a bit of fun, relive your olden days like I normally do, then please come and see me at the end. Thank you very much for your time.
I don't know what's happened there. <laughs> Wasn't me. Hmm. Windows is hibernating. Oh. Gosh. A child of the 60s and I forgot power to the people? My apologies. Luckily, though, uh, or uh, first of all, unluckily, uh, one of our planned presenters had to cancel out today. But luckily, that gives us slack. (laughs) It also is fairly embarrassing that I forgot to plug this thing in. All right, so resuming Windows. Good, good. That's a good sign. Flash, flash. Oh, you should charge your battery. (laughs) Good advice now. (laughs) Let's see here. Password. What's the password? (laughs) P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D. I'm old. I can't remember these things anymore. All right. So that was Julie. Thanks for the slack there, Julie. Uh, Dorothy Graham. Thank you, Lee. That's great. I'm going to ask you a question. Is the mic not... It's on? Can you hear me? Anyone who can't, put your hand up. (laughs) Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. Where on earth have you been? Have you heard that before? What I mean is, where in the world have you been? Have you seen a lot of the world? Are you well-traveled? My husband and I just had a wonderful holiday, and I'll tell you about it in a minute, but I want to ask you another question first of all. How many continents have you been to? Has anyone here been to every continent? Nobody? How about six out of seven? A few. Okay, me too. Uh, have you been, if you're from the States, or even if you haven't been, are, are you, how many states have you been to? Have you been to every state? Anybody here? Ah, fantastic. How many of you have been to Alaska? Oh, wow, that's a lot. Well, we just had a wonderful holiday in Alaska. Three weeks in a camper van, an RV, sorry. Uh, And we we did uh, 1,600 miles, saw lots of stuff. It was great. And I was telling the uh, SQE people when I arrived about this holiday. And Drew was there. And he said, I've been to Alaska. Oh, what did you see? I said, the airport. (laughs) But he's been to Alaska, right? We've both been to the state. Now, what about your software? What's this got to do with software? Where in the software have your tests been? Are they well-traveled? This is what we mean by coverage. I totally agree with what Dale said about trust trumps coverage, but coverage can also be useful. So what is coverage? Well, we have our software here and we have some tests, and when our tests run, they cover a bit of the software. So this part of the software has been tested by these tests, has been touched, and these other parts of the software have not yet been covered. So here we have another example where we have a few more tests, And in this example, we've covered maybe 60 or 70% of the tests as opposed to 30% in the first example. And here's yet another example. We have even more tests and, oh, hey, look at that. We've got 100% coverage. Wow, that must be really good, right? 100%, what a great number 100% is. It just means total completeness of everything like that. So now we've finished testing, right? Anybody think there's something wrong with this picture? (laughs) Oh, good, good. I'm glad to hear it. Because this is not the be-all and end-all. Because just because we've covered everything in one dimension does not mean that we've covered everything in all dimensions. And there are many dimensions that we can look at in the coverage of software. How much has been tested? It's 100%. The thing is, when you say coverage, you need to think, of what? 100%... Of what? 
We could look at modules, we could look at functions, at features, at statements, at branches, at data, at states. If you look at state coverage, both Drew and I achieved 100% coverage of Alaska, right? But if you look at roads driven, mountain scenes, wildlife scene, I think we'd have a much higher percentage of coverage than Drew did on that trip. So what is coverage? Coverage is actually a relationship between the tests and what is being tested. It is an objective measure. It is a measure of thoroughness in some dimension, not in every dimension. And it can be very useful. Now, it's not necessarily a good idea to be thorough in your testing. But if your test objective is to be thorough, it can be very useful to know whether you were or not. So, but 100% covered is not 100% tested for four reasons. First of all, as I've already mentioned, there are many levels of coverage. Getting one doesn't say anything about the others. Well, sometimes it does, but we won't go there just now. The second thing is that you only need one test to tick that coverage box. You only need to step foot on the ground in Alaska to say that you've covered that state. You only need one data combination to say false and you've covered that branch. There might be 200 important ways that you can get to that false branch, but you only need one. There's another thing. We had a client once who, uh, they, they were very concerned about the quality of the software being supplied by their supplier. And they thought, we need better testing from them, so we'll require them to do 100% branch coverage. And they did, and they bought a tool, and here came the reports, 100% branch coverage. They forgot something. They forgot to say, oh, and by the way, the tests should be good test, and they should pass, and the software should work. <laughs> okay, so you could get 100% coverage with really bad tests. That's probably not what you want. And finally, what coverage does show you is what is there. It's whether you have tested what is there. So it doesn't say anything about what isn't there. It's just showing you what's been covered by what is there. So 100% coverage might be a useful thing to know, but it's not 100% tested. And now here's one other thing about coverage. And this is something which has been, um, I'm oh, sorry, I'm going backwards. User error. This is what, I see this more and more lately, and it really bugs me, okay? This is what coverage is not. Here are our tests, and there we are. The tests have done all the testing the tests were doing. In other words, we have run all of the tests we thought of. We've got 100% coverage of our tests. That is not coverage. Maybe you call that test completion, and it might be interesting to know how, how many of the tests you plan to run you did run, but coverage is a relationship between the tests and something else, not between the tests and themselves. Tests will always, it's, it's not the same thing. It's not coverage. It could be useful to know, but don't call it coverage. It's a bit like saying, I'm really well-traveled because I drive a long way to work every day. <laughs> so when you hear something like this, have you heard, we need to increase our coverage? What you should think is coverage of what? So if you see what coverage are we getting, you should say coverage of what? Oh, you're catching on quick. Uh, make sure you cover 100%. If we automate, we'll get better coverage. We need as much coverage as possible. Oh, you do catch on quick. I hope the virtual audience was doing this as well. That was the audience participation part. Well, thank you very much. This is, uh, whenever you hear coverage, ask of what and possibly why. Um, remember that coverage is a relationship between the tests and what is tested. And if it's test completion, don't call it coverage. I wonder if when you go over to see the vendors, there might be some interesting discussions when they talk about coverage. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Does anybody here agree that testers are going away? Yes or no? I can't hear you. No, we're not going away. We are not going away. You guys are worse than my little league. I can't hear you. No, we're not going away. We're not going away. But there is, but there is one thing that I did agree. Oops. Summary. In summary, I'm done. Um, there is one thing I agreed with James about. And this is what I want to explain. A couple years ago at a keynote here, Star East 2010, I made this statement. If you're a tester and you don't know how to code, you won't have a job in five years. Now, keynotes are supposed to be controversial, right? But reading the Twitter after that, after that talk, whoa, did I hit a raw nerve. So I want to spend a couple minutes and tell you why I said that and what I think is happening and, and my justification for it. So why did I say this? First of all, I think the world is changing. All right, It is changing. I have a good friend in healthcare who says this, and I love it. Our economy is not recovering. Our, recon our economy is forever changing. Of course, he's in healthcare. But um, yeah, they're changing, we hope. Uh, but the po I think the point is this. How many people hear the word agility applied to almost everything now, right? Uh, economic agility, you know, your, your son. Well, he's just not agile in the classroom. Um, that means he's stupid, right? It used to mean he was stupid, all right? But we're not the only people using the agile word, right? We're not the only people. Obama's using it, agile government. I can't wait to see that. But uh, agile economy, agile this, agile that. But it is true. The world, I believe, is changing. We're trying to figure out how to do things more adaptive, more lean, more agile. I don't think it's just a software thing, but I think we should take all the credit for it, right? I mean, we came up with the idea. or we, I use we literally. I wasn't there. But anyway, but, but what I think is great or interesting about agile, agile software or agile in general, is it's a philosophy. It's not a methodology. It's a way of thinking about things. And I think that's why it'll stick around, because I think we believe in the philosophy. We might not agree on the individual practices, but we agree the philosophy makes sense. So what does Agile say about testing? Well, Agile says all sorts of things about testing, and, and Agile impacts testing. Short iterations means we got to get through testing quick, right? We got to get through testing pretty quick, certain types of testing quick. I think, to me, that means more automation. Others agree. Whole team quality. Everybody owns quality. Yay! It's not our problem anymore, right? It's everybody's problem. That's a good thing, though. We try to emerge design. That means it grows. So we better have good tests to check it as it grows and regression test it as it grows because it might break something that we did before. And we're asking developers to test, which God knows they should have been doing this from day one, right? They should have been. They never did. But okay, at least finally they're doing some of this. So I think it is changing testing. And I think because of that, it means we have to do more automation. That's my first point. We have to do more automation. Whether we like it or not, we have to do it to make it work. All right, this is my, uh, oops, this is my uh, video, or my uh, rapid motion here. Um, so, so we, yeah, sorry. Oh. All right, second. Second point, those other slides you don't care about. We've seen them all. I've seen that triangle 12 times so far, today alone. All right, I don't want to see the triangle anymore. But here's my second point. So I think automation's happening. Automation's important. As testers, we have to do more automation. That's my belief. Second is, I have cold, hard evidence now, baby. I didn't have it last year when I threw that little zinger out there and everybody skewered me on Twitter. But I got cold, hard evidence. Two things I want to mention. Food for thought. I believe this is happening whether we think it is or, or we, we want it to happen or not as testers. First of all, Elizabeth Hendrickson posed the same question on her blog. She said, hey, it seems to me like everybody's asking for programming skills and testing, testing recs now. And she went out and did a quick survey of some of the sites that she uses and other people use. And what she found was about 80% of the job recs for testers said programming was a requirement of the job. Now, she, you know, she caveated it appropriately and said, hey, look, I'm here on the West Coast, and we're wacky here on the West Coast, um, but there's all sorts of crazy things going on here on the West Coast, and yes, it's very product-centric, and Agile's a big thing here, and, and maybe it's just because we're on the West Coast. Well, I took that as a challenge, right? So I called a good friend of mine, referenced up here, Paul, if you're out there, hi, Paul. Uh, Paul's on the East Coast, right? Paul runs a company called Trusted QA. 
they source testers. That's all they do. They've been doing it for 20 years. And I said, Paul, man, my buddy, my brother, tell me you've been keeping stats on all the job wrecks you've done in the last 20 years. And he said, I have. And I said, good, I want you to go back 20 years and give me some data. And he said, who are you again? I can't remember what your name is. No, he said, oh, I'll do a few years. So this is what Paul did. He did an analysis for me. And interestingly enough, this is what he he came up with. Of all the job wrecks that they placed people in the last six years, this is the percentage of those that required programming. Look at the trend. It is moving in that direction. It's going to continue to move in that direction, whether we like it or not. So this is a quick wake up call. Yoo-hoo, wake up everybody. You need to learn how to code. You don't have to be a programmer, but you should know how to script. You should learn how to script. It'll help your career. It'll help your job. And it's in the best interest of where you're headed in your job. You ought to learn how to do it. That's my, my thing. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Sure. We'll have those downers for you later on today. <laughs> At the reception? Yeah, at the reception. Oh, I love people who are enthused. Martin. Martin Paul. No. I guess this is better. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Um, no, not a wake up call. Not at uh, five, whatever it's twenty five, and you're already woken up. I guess for the whole day, because of all these great presentations. I want to make a couple of statements about the cloud. Actually, what we have been doing in premises like this is develop software is uh, buy it, is outsource or insource it, uh, implement it, uh, test it, of course, and we are connected with a couple of workstations, uh, added the internet to it, actually for our mail, for file transfer, actually for, for serving, and connected quite a lot more workstations to it. I think this is... Great, but the problem is, for instance, with this data center where you're working, where your systems are being run, uh, they had a problem that only 20% of the equipment was actually used. The rest was idle time. So the, the great thing was that we invented virtualization, virtual machines, a good foundation for cloud computing. And we were able to work with very thin data centers, actually, we also outsourced our mainframes and service, uh, uh, servers, etc. Another thing was SOA, soft service-oriented architecture. Actually, not re-code and recode all our code again for the services, but actually couple the services around the uh, enterprise service bus. Those three things: internet technology virtualization, and so are, are the prerequisites, in fact, are the foundation for cloud computing. Enabling us service on demand, pay per use, enabling us flexibility, actually enabling us easy access. You can start with it now, immediately. Push on the button and you're in the cloud. You have it. Actually, also a good I would say, a way to start working in the, the new world, in the, the new world of working, actually at home. In my country, I live in the Netherlands, 25% of the people do their work at home. You don't have to go there. You can work anywhere you want. Going into the cloud. Getting your infrastructure, your service, <laughs> servers, uh, your network facilities, but also your storage in the cloud as a service, application platforms as a service, software as a service, anything from your app up to a big CRM system 
or a billing system, whatever. Everything, in fact, is possible. Desktop as a service, testing as a service, everything as a service in the cloud. The public cloud, like Air, the only thing you have to pay for it, but you also have to pay for American Air, you know, taxes. And rain, it's for free, by the way, here. Okay. Uh, big companies don't go public immediately. They hesitate. Maybe they aren't allowed to go public. They keep private, keep it private for a moment. Hybrid, actually, community clouds, communication clouds, all kinds of clouds that are available today. Is it easy for us, for testers? Now, I've just been to a presentation of somebody who explains the cloud for QA. Uh, many, many tools. You have to know a lot before you are able to enter the world of the cloud, especially if you're a QA person. So it's not that simple as this represents. And be aware of people that say, it's only a data center party. <laughs> it's not. Okay? Or we have done this for many, many years already. Okay? Or we are not going public. So no worry. Okay? That's not right. So you look at the cloud, there are a couple of, I would say, new challenges for us. Testers, in fact, that's what, I, what I'm saying, should widen their scope a little bit. Look at legal, look at laws, look at legislation. That's a difficult word for if you're from Holland. Legislation is L, you know. You do have legislation here. Patriot Act, for instance, okay? In Europe, we have 27 countries with 27 legislation sets. You know what I mean? And that's quite difficult. And I'm just talking about U.S. and Europe. How about the rest of the world? Do you know where your data is stored, where your systems are running? You don't know in the cloud. The only thing is that you know somebody, a provider, who's taking care of it. Okay? There are different laws that you're uh, related to. Another thing is... Uh, ownership. Who owns the, the data? Your data is somewhere in wherever, Asia. It's stored there. Uh, how about bankruptcy of your supplier? What will happen? Who owns the data? For whatever reason, that's something that you should consider. And security, of course. Now, that's the number one, top of the list, if people are thinking about the cloud. I I can tell you that Amazons and IBMs and Apples and Microsofts and Googles of this world, they are working very hard on security. This is their core business, okay? That's not the biggest issue. It's even safer than in home, at home, in your own data center, I can tell you, okay? The problem is no access. You've violated whatever reason or rule you don't even know, and you can't work that day. It's like... Your flight has been cancelled. You know? You know this? You can't work anymore. And how about technology? How about the internet? The cloud is completely relying on the internet. If there's no internet, <laughs> if there's no power, no power here, if there's no power wherever your applications are ran or wherever your data is, you will have a problem. In fact, you are lost. Okay? You have to consider. You have to consider legal. You have to consider ownership. You have to consider security. You have to consider technology. You have to consider performance. That doesn't fit in lost. Sorry for this. Okay? You have to consider usability, etc., etc. There are Quite some new areas where testers should, I would say, dig into. That's, in fact, the message. Also the same message as uh, James Whitaker addressed this morning, okay? New areas in the non-functional area. Become the guru for privacy. That's what I'm saying here, okay? What to do? Innovate. That's extremely important. The non-functionals and also new non-functionals become more and more important. Ask your people in the company or your customers, what are you trying to do? Actually, uh, what type of cloud computing? 
and then find out about the risks. There are many risks. We are working on a book, and in the meantime, we have 140 risks. So don't reinvent wheels. Call me, and I'll give you the list, okay? But that's what's happening, and transfer those risks to, I would, sets of tests, whatever, test uh, measures, and that's what you have to carry out. So the, my point is, testers should widen their scope, go for more non-functionals, okay? Functionality is okay, I think. We can do that. Combine traditional testing and new testing. Uh, it's not a hype. Don't get lost. You can do it, I'm sure. Thank you. Thanks, Merton. Well, this is the end of uh, our lightning talks, and we want to thank our speakers today. Those of you out there in the virtual world, hope you've had a great day with us today. Those of you here in the physical world, uh, uh, hope the same for you. I want to remind you of the, uh, the party tonight. There's a reception down in the expo area. starts about right now. And uh, there's uh, food and drink and all kinds of fun things. And then we'll